Would they want me killed? I wanted to live. Moyavoina searched the three. Two shots rang out ahead. They fired into the air. I swore and continued to walk forward, carrying Andrishka on my back. Several soldiers and an officer came out of the trench, standing and waiting for us to approach. Mm, who are they? Where are you going? Asked the officer. I explained. And these? They're wounded on the way. Please send both of them to the hospital and take me to the military academy. We'll do it, the lieutenant agreed. Where's your package? Show me the bag. I unbuttoned. I kept the packet on my chest under my uniform. It was smeared with blood on one edge. Are you wounded? <laughs> the lieutenant asked. I was bandaging a wounded man. And this one, the other one? Nervous breakdown. Take him to the hospital, too. The lieutenant called for a semi-truck. The guys were loaded and sent to the hospital, and I was sent by my jeep to the military training center. The hospital was located in a deep ravine near the Teresa River. On a steep, carefully camouflaged exit, we went down to the bottom of a deep ravine. Where the headquarters was located, a lieutenant from the barrier troops introduced me to a slender general with the face of a refined intellectual. To general carefully, so as not to get blood stained, tore off the envelope sealed with sealing wax, rid the contents and said, None of this is necessary anymore. Your men are scrambling. The word scramble in the mouth of this general cut me painfully. It can't be. I objected. The general looked at me carefully. He said sternly. It can. He got up from his chair and retired to the communication centre, dug into the clay wall of the ravine. We stayed where I was. Only now I felt terribly tired and helpless. Meanwhile, some bustle was observed around. Officers were running, some boxes, chairs, typewriters were being loaded onto trucks that somehow ended up at the bottom of the ravine. I realise the headquarters was being evacuated, and what about me? I thought to myself, I handed over the package, my unit is retreating somewhere, I am alone and nobody needs me here, I am a stranger, I will be taken for a deserter. Now I must stick to the headquarters where at least this general knows. I waited until a general familiar to me came out of the communications centre and turned to him. I see that the headquarters is being evacuated. Maybe I could help in some way. Hmm. What's your specialty? A Salah liaison officer. Very good, said the general. Go down that ravine over there. There, about 800 metres from here, our telephonists are waiting for cars to take them over the Volga, and the cars will arrive in 45 minutes, an hour tops. You will be their chief. The assignment pleased me. After all, I was not alone and in business. I immediately went along the ravine to the place where the general indicated. The ravine here was not so deep and much narrower. Thirty girls in new, well-fitted uniforms with white collars were sitting and lying in wait for evacuation. Hello, girls. I was sent to you as a senior. The girls looked at me with surprise and fright. Unshaven, in a blood-stained uniform, I must have made a bad impression on them. After all, they were accustomed to their neat, prim officers. My appearance and my appearance frightened them. I saw that and decided to encourage them. In about forty-five minutes we'll be sent two semi-trucks. We'll sit down and go over the Volga. And if anything happens, I'm a front-line soldier, I've been in more trouble than that. What could happen? One girl asked fearfully. You never know. War. My answer frightened the girls even more. They did not suppose that anything could happen to them. The army headquarters is always deep behind the lines. I realized that I had said something stupid, and I was silent. The girls were silent too, sometimes giving me frightened glances. I looked at my watch. The time dragged by surprisingly slowly. But forty-five minutes passed. An hour passed. I began to worry a little, but I tried not to show it. Hmm, comrade lieutenant, when will they come for us? A girl asked. Bassoon girls, be patient. Somewhere far away from us a shell exploded in the air. The Germans were hitting the squares. The girls got worried looking up at the sky. Another shell exploded. Thank God, not over us, I thought. One of the girls was hit in the shoulder by a shrapnel. The girls jumped to their feet and scattered. If they had all run in the same direction, it would have been easy to stop them. But they were running in different directions. And then the wounded one grabbed my arm and shouted. Don't leave me, don't leave me, please. It was clear from the girl's behaviour that her wound was not dangerous. Pulling her hands away from me, I assured the girl, I won't leave you. Just let me stop them. 
Then I ran out of the ravine. I see the girls scattered all over the field. How do I collect them now? Let's see what you've got. The girl trustingly let me tear her vest. It's a small wound. The shrapnel scratched the soft tissue. I reassured the girl. Do you have a personalised bag? I used up my bag. I don't know. The bag was in her breast pocket. I quickly opened it and dressed the wound. There was a road ahead of us. Two trucks appeared on it. They were speeding past us. I ran in front of the trucks, grabbed my gun, shout, stop. The trucks slowed down and stopped. Why are you waving your gun around? And I've got 30 female liaison officers from the army headquarters. I have to get them to stay. Hey, we'll throw all the junk off the car, save your girls. But let's hurry up. In half an hour the Germans will be here. I thought, can we get them together? I turned around and they were all here. Murray up, girls. The Germans are on our tail. In no time we unloaded the cars, climbed into the bodies, and here we are already rolling along the road to Stalingrad. I'm standing in the body of the front car above the cabin. I look ahead. The road goes on a steep slope, rolling down to the Sarisa. The road is good. Our cars go along it quickly. The steppe is absolutely empty. The war has not yet disfigured it with neither craters nor traces from tank tracks. I know that the Tsaritsa flows into the Volga in Stalingrad. That's why the city used to be called Tsaritsin. It's hot, but the cars are going fast, and the warm wind caresses my face. The wounded girl sits in the cabin. She was bandaged, and she calmed down. Bushes, not bushes. They're tanks. Ours? No, not ours, a German. It's strange that they're already there. I knock on the roof of the cabin. The cars stop. The driver gets out of the cab and first of all examines the slopes. The stingrays are fine. What happened? He asks. In front look, German tanks. Where? That. It's the bushes. Laughing assures the elderly driver. I noticed them a long time ago. The driver of the second car, a young white-haired boy with white eyebrows, clapped his white eyelashes. What bushes? It's a fact, German tanks. Take a good look. They are moving. Haven't you ever seen a German tank? Now you're shitting your pants. German tanks. Maybe there are tanks? Why would there be German tanks here? I, who had seen enough German tanks, no longer doubted what I had seen. German tanks have a different silhouette and sound. Of course they're German. Uh, come on, girls, get off the cars. Now, let's not take any chances. Let's go on foot. Nobody moved. I repeated the order. And then my girl started talking, screaming all at once. They won't come out. You go out if you want to. And I have no right to dispose of them. Who am I? They just... Why am I in charge of their lives? One girl with a face distorted with anger began to beat her fists in my chest, hysterically shouting. Make sure would, bastard traitor. I was insulted by these words, but that wasn't all I cared about. I was responsible for their lives and I didn't deserve these insults. I had to stop being hysterical. I lunged and punched the girl in the cheekbone. She swayed, and if she hadn't been supported by her friends, she would have fallen off her feet. In the silence that followed, I shouted in a bad voice. Yes, everybody out of the car, and I grabbed my gun just for the fun of it. The girls silently obeyed, and the one I hit, sobbing, went to the side. The second car, too, the girls left without talking. The elderly driver was stubborn. Yes, I'm not leaving the car. I'm responsible for her. Your business. But now you see that they are German tanks. I see, but I don't believe it. I think I'll pass. What if that crept into my heart? What if they really are ours? And Jem, I will not abandon the cars. For some reason he repeated. Maybe he was expecting my objection. Hmm. Can I go with him? I can't walk, pleaded the wounded girl. Do you realize how dangerous it is? Hmm. Please. Please. She repeated pitifully, and I gave in. It was not so much her words as her voice and the frightening pallor of her face that affected me. I had been in hospitals before, and I could tell by some signs whether someone was alive or not. All right, I said. The car started to move and began to move away from us quickly. We left the second car on the road and started to go down to the river. Every now and then my girls turned around and looked after the passing car. I kept my eyes on her. And what if it is really our tanks and they really will pass, I thought. My girls will tear me apart, and I wish the car wouldn't slip through. 
I was ashamed of that wish and now I wanted the car to pass. It's hard to make responsible decisions, but it's even harder when the worst happens. The car was less than a quarter of the way through when shells began to burst around it. One exploded very close. The car swerved and rolled onto its left side. The driver got out through the right door and ran away from the car, but, changing his mind, returned and began to pull the girl out, suddenly from behind a hillock, very close to us, so that the crosses on its armour were clearly visible. A heavy tank crawled out and gave a machine gun burst. Both the car and the people were instantly engulfed in flames. One of the girls cried to tears. The others were in shock. Even closer to us, another tank crawled out of the hillside. It was he, not the tanks we saw in the distance, who hit and lit our car on f It seemed to me that he was turning his turret in our direction. Get down. I commanded. Crawl to the river. The girls didn't know how to crawl and caused the young boy to burst into a fit of nervous laughter. I cut him off, and he fell silent. We crawled up to the Saritza. It flowed in a deep gully. Even I, a trained guy, was afraid to jump down. So deep was the ravine. But here we were not afraid of any tank. I jumped down, but the white-haired boy stayed behind. Don't be afraid, I shouted. There's sand here. Let the girls pull you down on their outstretched arms and I'll pick you up. They'll realize it's not so scary. The boy decided to do as I told him, and I picked him up. Now come on, you girls. Bring each other down and we'll support you. But it was high, and the girls were afraid to jump down after us. The girls didn't dare. I don't know what happened there. Maybe the tank shot at an empty car left on the road, but the frightened girls fell in a bunch, crushing us and each other. I rolled to the edge and covered my head with my hands. I was hit by boots, feet, hands, bodies. But everything for me was only bruises. With the young driver was worse. In a panic, one of the girls fell him on his back. Someone jumped on his stomach. The guy was unconscious, pink foam on his lips. I was angry with the girls, but I didn't scold them. I saw with what a sense of pity, guilt and fright, they looked at the boy. The one who had jumped on his belly could hardly remember where she had jumped. There was no one to blame. I ordered to put the boy on my overcoat and drag him behind me across the sand. The girls succeeded each other. It was getting dark. We were still weaving towards the town, dragging the wounded man behind us, hoping to take him to the hospital. But an hour and a half later he died. The girls dug a grave in the sand and buried him. I called a halt. It turned out that the girls during the evacuation of the headquarters threw their bags on the cars. There was nothing to eat, but no one grumbled. I saw that they were dead tired, so I let them sleep a little. I took out my gun to guard them, sat down on the sand and decided not to sleep. I sat there, and the girls surrounded me on all sides, trustingly clinging to me. After an hour I picked them up and led them toward the town again. German flares appeared in the sky, and the girls got excited. Where are you taking us? The Germans are there, I reassured them. There are no Germans there. It's a simulated encirclement. German planes are dropping rockets on parachutes to mislead us and so panic. The girls believed and disbelieved me. But then, when on our way began to appear large and small groups of soldiers retreating to Stalingrad, a little calmed down. On the outskirts of Stalingrad, we were detained by a barrier detachment. They brought us to some building, found out who we were and why we were here. Then they took us to an empty cellar, where there was a single iron bed with a few planks on it, and the girls themselves offered it to me. During the whole time of the transition I'd given them a chance to sleep, but I had not slept. They knew it. Now I gladly used my privilege, lay down on the boards and fell asleep. I woke up to a soldier shaking me by the shoulders. Yes, run to the phone. It's the army headquarters. I woke up immediately and went to the phone. The telephone receiver was bursting with swearing. Someone on the other end of the line was scolding me for depriving the army of communication. I knew the war and had no doubt that it was he who was scolding me now. Instead of sending first of all the telephonists, did not send transportation in time. And now he was taking revenge on me. Uh, bring the girls to headquarters immediately. Do you hear me? Immediately? Hey. I hear, Cubby answered. But you are a scumbag, a bitch and a bastard. I shouted into the phone. I knew war. I knew that the most dangerous people in it are panickers and cowards. These from fear can shoot at their own, blame their mistake or crime on him, lie to him and destroy him if necessary. They, these weak men, are strong in their meanness and cynicism. They are also the cruelest in war. 
They are always not guilty of anything and are only right in everything. Often they are hailed as heroes. No, I decided I will not go to the army headquarters. I will bring the girls to the crossing, but I will not cross the Volga. The girls themselves will tell me what happened to them. Go now, said the head of the barrier detachment when I hung up the phone. You'll still have time to ferry the girls while it's dark. The crossing does not work in the daytime. And he inquire, who did you call a scoundrel? I don't know, but he's a bastard and a coward. It happens, he agreed. I led the girls to the crossing. The city was on fire. The red-hot iron of the roofs, with the sound of a burst bomb caught and rolling into a roll, flew to the ground. To the crossing we were led by one of the girls, a Stalingrad resident herself. She navigated well in the burning city. Here was the bakery. Here was the post office. Here was our school. Here was the house of my best friend. And your parents. They all died. My father in the battle for Smolensk, and my mother during the first fire. She stopped and added. All of them. I felt sorry for the girl. On the approach to the crossing on both sides of the road lay the corpses of horses. During bombing raids, people ran away and hid in the ruins of houses and horses were killed. There was exemplary order at the crossing. The orders of the commanders, whoever you were by rank, were obeyed without question. They already knew about us here. We were met even before the crossing, taken to the basement of some store and told to wait to be summoned. It was the basement of a Stalingrad department store, described many times in historical and fiction literature and depicted in movies. Later it was the headquarters of Paulus's army. On the shelves lay various items no one needed now. Bags of blue, large buttons of all colours, needles, thread, and rolls of pinkish plastic. The girls began to cut off pieces of it for their colour. I cut myself a plate into a clipboard. I could write on it with a pencil and then erase it with an ordinary rubber band. And I also took some sewing needles and thread. These were not only necessary items for a soldier, but also amulets. I believed that I should be lucky with them. At the front where many things and life itself is decided by chance, we were all superstitious. We believed in various omens and amulets, spit over the left shoulder to avoid jinxing, were afraid to stumble on the left foot, no luck. The Stalingrad girl interested me, and I got to talking to her. I don't remember what we talked about. It didn't matter. I just liked the girl. A messenger came and said that we were called to the crossing. It was a cold September morning with low grey clouds. At the dock, a small military boat shuddered with its engine running. The elderly, as it seemed to me then, Captain, the head of the crossing, gave the command to load. The girls, in a hurry, entered the boat. I stood with the chief of the crossing and asked him if he knew where our division was located. We have not crossed to that side, he answered. And where it is located, we should ask the commandant. Meanwhile, the motor on the boat was running more intensively. The boat was getting ready for departure. No, comrade lieutenant, the girls shouted. Why don't you sit down? Goodbye, girls, I shouted, shouting over the noise of the engine. What about us? Where shall we go? Language will lead us to Kiev. Without any signal, the boat departed from the pier and began to move away. For some reason, I felt sad. What will happen to these girls? How will the war treat them? I th and the boat went farther away and soon disappeared into the fog. Hmm, comrade captain. I turned to the captain with a red armband on his sleeve. Where is the 33rd Guards Division? Why do you want to know? This is my division. Not immense. I gave my papers. Why are you here? No. I've been sending female signalers across the Volga to army headquarters. Only now I realized how unconvincing my answer sounds. Why did some lieutenant send female signalers, and even to the army headquarters? He'll lie, hmm, said the captain. Deserter. You should have said so directly. And then with the where is the 33rd Division approach. We, brother, have seen more of them here. We ask the chief of the crossing. We won't think it, mm, said the captain, and ordered the soldiers. Take away your weapons. You're coming with us. Where to? Also the commandant's office, and then to the penalty battalion. The penalty battalion didn't scare me much. It was equally dangerous here in any unit, but it hurt. I thought I was not guilty of anything, and naively hoped that the Commandant's office would sort everything out, as if the Commandant had nothing to do but to find out why some lieutenant was not in his unit. 
Gradually, this thought began to bother me more and more. My situation was not good. Meanwhile, Stalingrad came to life, bursting with artillery shots, explosions, machine gun bursts. At that time, we were leisurely marching along the streets not yet covered by battles. On the road to the crossing in both directions, trucks were passing by, some of them for ammunition, food, medicines, others, already loaded, were returning to the unit. All the supply of the Stalingrad front went through the crossing. I was not alone. With the Commandant under a convoy of soldiers was a group of detainees. Together with them, though not under convoy, were three civilians. Despite the early hour, all three of them were drunk and from time to time they asked me questions, hardly moving their naughty tongues. Hmm, comrade captain, are we going to blow it up soon? Hmm, do they want to blow up? I asked a detainee like me. A, a distillery. Me answered reluctantly, they are waiting for an order. So they're drunk. N, N, no, we're not drunk, but we're sorry for the good. The good is lost. In another situation, it would have made me laugh. But now I didn't feel like laughing. My situation seemed hopeless. But always in such hopeless situations, something will happen and offer some way out. But that's what happened now. Near us, sharply braked car from the back jumped two officers. Grigory, why you? A misunderstanding. They took me for a deserter. He's a good guy. Let him go. If we have to, we'll let him go. Of course we have to. Now? Why are you grabbing guns? The Armenian laughed. Us if out of habit. The captain smiled too, started looking at the soldier's books. He chose mine and gave it to me. Nest is a take. Give me back my gun, I reminded him. Having received my gun, I said goodbye to the strict captain and together with my fellow soldiers got into the truck with shells and, joking about everything, arrived safely to the grain elevator. The remnants of our division occupied a small section of the front. Here there was already an intense battle. But about the details of the battle I do not want to write. All ordinary battles are similar to each other. It is mutual destruction of people on one side and on the other. Describing the battle is boring and perhaps unnecessary. Have you killed? And they were surprised when I answered in the affirmative. I was insulted by this surprise. People who don't know war don't try to understand its laws. Here you either get killed or you get killed. Would they want me to be killed? I wanted to live. Politicians don't fight wars. They make wars and send soldiers to kill each other, putting this vile necessity in colourful verbal wrappings. The Great Patriotic War was not like that. Here everything was clear, and although here too there were verbal wrappings, but the soldiers did not need them. The enemy's behaviour, his goals spoke for themselves. It was about conquering our territory, our wealth and turning our peoples into their obedient slaves. That's what they wrote and talked about, and they behaved accordingly. Their Nazi theory proclaimed the Germans to be superhuman and us to be an inferior race, subhuman, born to be slaves. We did not agree to be slaves to anyone. We had human dignity and pride. In every war it is no small matter who came to establish by force of arms their order, and it makes absolutely no difference what that order is, whether it is good or bad. In 1812, Napoleon Bonaparte invaded Russia. He did not bring serfdom to Russia, and Russia at that time was serfdom. The serfs took up pitchforks and drove Napoleon's army out. They realized that they could not live under alien orders. And it was not bigotry, let it be bad. The Russian peasant realized that he could not live like the French, no matter how hard he tried. He knew little and understood even less what progress was, and this saved him from foolishness like today's. But he knew that no one comes into another man's house with a gun to do good. He knew that even coming into a stranger's house unarmed with the desire to do only good, only misfortune and suffering result. Peoples live as their lives, their history, their morals, habits, customs have developed. These mores, habits and customs have developed in this way and otherwise not by chance. It is the result of centuries of experience. Interference in the life of the people for their own benefit is the greatest crime against human rights. This does not need to be proved. We see it now in our own lives. Human life is priceless. I pursued this thought in my movie Ballad of a Soldier. Among the Germans there were also people worthy of living. Humanists argue. How can you shoot such people? But a soldier who comes into someone's house with a gun to rob his master and make him his slave. Such a soldier, whatever his qualities, is part of a machine created to rob and kill. 
and as part of this machine he deserves to be killed. It was not about me, but about my people. My parents, my fiancé, my country, its wealth, created by the labour of countless generations. I was ready to die for them, and I thought I had the right to shoot, and I did. We didn't fight long at the Grain Elevator. Our division was down to 240 men. The command decided to take us from the front, ferry us to the rear, and replenish us with new men. Russia's age-old military culture suggested that this was the way to preserve something more than the lives of a handful of soldiers. The traditions of the division. We were ferried across the Volga, and for several days we were in the farm Rybushy. We rested and waited for our ec The writer Konstantin Semonov came to visit us. Then I was acquainted and cooperated with him. But then he was an unattainable value for me. In Rybachi, I saw him only at a rally. Once a truck was passing through the farm, in which we saw Zora Kondrashov among other penalized men, we stopped the truck and demanded that Kondrashov be given to us. Our arguments were strong, and Zora was released. What a joy it was. Now we were together again. The train came and took us to the Tregulier of camps. On the way to Tambov, we were resting on the bunks and talking quietly among ourselves about the phenomenon called deviation. I had a different opinion about it than Pavel. I began to present my arguments, but Pavel suddenly cut me off. Don't. Please don't. He groaned and suddenly went into a seizure. In his delirium, he remembered that poor boy who had begged me to shoot him. Poor Pavlusha. How many shots he had fired from his automatic rifle during the war, and this shot he could not forget. God only knows what was going on in his mind. The attack lasted a long time. They called the doctor. The doctor said it was serious. Gave him medicine. He was quiet. And the next morning he was as talkative as ever and even joked, but at times out of the blue he stopped talking and swallowed tears. Treguliev camps were located in the forest, in the vicinity of Tambov. New soldiers began to arrive here. We taught them what we knew how to do, and by that time we knew a lot. We were once taken to Tambov for a cultural event. We were shown a play in the Tambov theatre. The show left no trace in my memory. But there were some unforgettable absurdities in the organisation of the formation. Formerly we were an infantry division, and the officials did with us as they should do with an infantry division. My company was transformed into a headquarters company, and now my duties included not only organising communications, but also to supply the headquarters with uniforms to organise meals for headquarters staff, and most importantly, I was sent twelve cavalry horses. Or horses for paratroopers are like an accordion for pops. The soldiers laughed. But I was not laughing. A horse is not a machine, it is alive, it needs special care. I had no idea how to treat them. Among those arriving in the replenishment, I managed to scrape together a few people who knew how to handle horses. But dealing with the supply men was no easier. Supplies began to feed and clothe me better than other officers. I was offended by this. I scandalized. And the supply officers couldn't understand what I was dissatisfied with. I loved my army, but the ineradicable civility of the supply officers killed me. Utvinko, our division commander, liked to organize formation reviews. The soldiers, on the contrary, did not like review and in general formation training. In their opinion, it only wore them out. I thought so too. But once at the front, we had to wade across a cold stream, and it was late fall. The water was icy. The soldiers stopped in front of the stream in indecision. You'll catch a cold, and then what to do? The petty officer gave the command to form a column. They lined up. Someone wanted to speak up. Melting in formation, warned the foreman. The soldier was silent. The foreman command. Murder set to march, march step by step. The formation moved and crossed the icy stream, and nobody got sick, not even a sneeze. Those who fought in the patriotic war remember well that we had no colds, but we had to be in the rain for weeks, and sleep in the snow, and get wet in the swamps. I had a different attitude to formation training. You have to be able to hold the line, but you don't need to waste time on marching. Wouldn't it be better to use this time for other useful activities, for example, for hand-to-hand -hand combat or overcoming obstacle courses? When preparing for a drill review, I did not chase my soldiers to the seventh sweat, as other officers did. I While walking away from the podium, keep up but not bothering yourself. Coming closer to the rostrum where the superiors stand, only make a good wave with your hands. The superiors cannot see your feet, but at the rostrum itself, when I put my hand to the visor, pull your toe, print your step, 
give out everything you are capable of. That's what we did, and we considered the best platoon and then the best company in formation training. After the review, Utvenko Command. Orchestra in the middle. Go Park. And everyone started dancing. Everybody danced as much as they could, who just jumped to the music, and who cacabluchiluvo complicated kneelers. But the fun was universal, it was a good release, necessary in the conditions of war, it relieved fatigue and stress. From my grandfather, who worked on beet plantations, I heard that the owner also organised dances. You're so tired during the day that you can't straighten your back. Then you dance and you can go back to work. It's an old invention. When the bosses came to inspect our classes, they were usually satisfied. A good commander, but he speaks to his subordinates in a whisper. I really had a principle never to raise my voice at a subordinate, not to swear, not to make a remark so that other soldiers could hear. This style of treatment of soldiers was called contemptuously to crave Sheena. In order not to create a traffic jam, I asked myself, Guys, we're being approached by our superiors. They're not happy with the way I'm treating you. So when they come, I will yell at you and behave like other commanders. Don't take offence. Having received the consent, I pleased the hearing of my superiors with a loud razzing of soldiers. How do you do your job? Have your hands grown out of your ass? Say that again. This is outrageous. You've gone to hell. The bosses were satisfied, and the soldiers liked to play circus. A new military doctor, Nina Majorova, came to our company. Nay, hey, can I see your horses? Yes. Can I ride them? I was a jockey, participated in competitions, won prizes. Don't you believe me? I'll show you the certificates. I believed it and I allowed it. Majorova took the horse, deftly saddled it, easily jumped into the saddle and rode along the forest road like a skilled jockey. Since then she came to the company often. Would you like me to teach you how to ride? She offered one day. I agreed. Choosing a free time from the exercises I called the infirmary. Nina came and gave me the first lessons. I learned how to saddle horses, the correct way to sit, and then to ride. Majorova first scolded me for mistakes and then began to praise me little by little. I was making progress. In honour of the October holidays we had a small dinner in the company. We drank moderately. I made a speech, but two machine gunners came and said that Uvenko called me. There was nothing to do. Service is service. I got up from the table and followed the machine gunners. I assumed that something had happened, since it was such an urgent call. At the edge of the forest stood a few houses, in them the headquarters was located. At the tables sat the officers of the headquarters and drank vodka. I was pushed into the next room before I could think of anything. Utvenko was feasting there with his guests, I think with the city authorities. And here he is, Grishka Chukrai, a brave paratrooper and, by the way, an artist. At the amateur talent show he won first prize. Come on, Greitzko, something like... I was hurt by this turn of events. Why should I entertain him? I flatly refused. Why? Udenko was surprised. Because you're all drunk. You didn't even offer me a drink. You didn't even give me a drink, and you already do something like that. Utvenko furrowed his eyebrows, but immediately laughed drunkenly. What a guy! He's been in my corpse from the very beginning. A paratrooper, Kozak, Katya, pour him a drink. I saw Utvenko's wife for the first time. I didn't like her. Unattractive, with lips smeared with vodka, smiling drunkenly, she poured me a full mug of vodka. From the humiliation I felt, I drank the whole mug. There was applause. Udenko applauded the loudest. The guests were shoving fried meat and pickles into my mouth. My head was buzzing, my eyes were blurry. I don't remember what else was there. The next day Nina Mayorova came to ride her horse. Why don't you saddle it? she asked. I drank a lot last night. I saw it. I was there too. You were. Did I do anything wrong there? No, she smiled. You behaved with great dignity, and added significantly. In your position, you made Udvenko dance with you. Then you were a little rude to him. In general, it's all right. I was very angry. I noticed that, and you don't be angry with Udvenko, he loves you very much. Like you love your horse. She laughed, jumped into the saddle, and galloped off into the forest. Soon, having sorted out what was going on, the horses were taken away from us. I was relieved of my duties as commander of the headquarters company, 
and we left for the front. I never saw Nina Mayorova again. They said that they saw her wounded in the leg. She was walking, and the blood was squelching in her boot. On the bunks in the calf wagon soldiers were trying to determine the route of our train. Not again to this hell, they said, remembering the battles in the big bend of the Don and at the elevator in Stalingrad. You can't bear it a second time. But the train came again to Stalingrad. We were unloaded at the station Kotluben and ordered to make a march of 70 kilometers. We were hurried. For speed we were given skis on them we could move quickly, but the snow was covered with uneven ice crust. It was difficult to move on skis. We took off the skis, loaded all our ammunition and weapons on them, and thus 70 kilometers were overcome in time. Now we were in the outer ring of encirclement of the Stalingrad group of Germans. Our task was not to miss Gotha's tank group, rushing by Manstein's order to the rescue of the encircled. There is a good movie by G. Echizar of Hot Snow. It shows these battles. They are truly terrible. But no cinematography can not convey what was in reality. The fighting was brutal, the blood turning the snow red, but Gotha's group could not break through to the encircled. Stalingrad became our victory, not only military but also moral. In the battles of Stalingrad, the delusional theory about the genetic superiority of the Germans collapsed and shattered into dust. With the victory in the Battle of Stalingrad began our offensive, which ended with the surrender of the Germans in the German capital Berlin. In the winter of 41, after our victory at Moscow, Hitler dismissed his prominent generals and himself became head of the German armed forces. He was jealous of the glory of his generals who had won brilliant victories in the West. He wanted to be known as a winner himself. He was preparing a trap for our command. With the help of powerful disinformation, he convinced our command that in the spring of 1942, we'll take an offensive on the Central Front, bypass Moscow from the south and, turning to the north, cut it off from the military industrial base behind the Urals. So our command believed, and he, having concentrated a powerful tank fist, moved it south to the Caucasus and Stalingrad. In the memoirs of our military leaders about this operation of the Germans are deaf. With the spring operation of the 42nd year, we suffered a serious set. In fact, it was a complete failure of our plans. According to all the laws of military science, we should have fallen. And we not only did not fall, but also won a victory, which was a turning point of the war. At the beginning of the war, we were inferior to the Germans in tactics, in armament. After Stalingrad, our tanks were better than German tanks, our airplanes were better than German airplanes, and our artillery, which was historically at its best. This miracle was created by women and teenagers who worked in the Urals in cold workshops without roofs, living in starvation, huddled in corners. Today, smart people shout that the communists did nothing, that the time of their rule was a black hole, lies designed to justify today's failed government. A return to the past is impossible and unnecessary. Our past was bloody and criminal, but it was also great, we have heard our recent president shouting, we are a great country, and who made it great? The Bolsheviks? In 18 years, our agrarian, backward country became the second industrialized power in the world. And what did Yeltsin's rule do in 10 years? Only ruined everything. We had a great science, now it's gone. It's ruined, plundered, sold. We had great technology. We can still sell unparalleled modern weapons, but we are not allowed on the international market and who created these weapons. Today's smart people are silent about it, because it was created by the Bolsheviks. We had a great art. The achievements of our technology amazed the world. We had great literature, variety, cinema. We had a great army, great intelligence. Where is it all? Why am I saying all this? Isn't it that we need to go back in time? No, our past is ambiguous, but it was there. It can neither be forgotten nor erased. A nation that has lost its historical memory, a nation that vilifies its history with masochistic malice, turns into a mob. The Duma, separation of powers, freedom of speech, rule of law, all these are words. The Duma thinks about its own welfare, establishes privileges for itself. The rule of law is a fiction. In our country, whoever is richest is right. Thieves break into the Duma. And freedom of speech is not only the freedom to tell the truth, but also the freedom to lie cynically and shamelessly. I am not concerned about all this because my error has gone. Since that's how things have turned out, I sincerely wish success to the young Democrats building capitalism, but I am concerned that the main capitals have been taken abroad, that the authorities and the Duma are avoiding this, in my opinion, 
the main problem in every possible way, and building capitalism without capital is as nonsense as giving artificial respiration in airless space. Goth's group was repulsed by us and urgently recalled by Manstein. Now we are going to Rostov to lock the Caucasian group of Germans in a new cauldron. They're rushing us, and we're in a hurry ourselves. As the people of the liberated villages greet us as liberators, weeping baptized. Finally, they tell us about the Germans' atrocities. We ourselves see the traces of these atrocities and hate the fascists even more. Every now and then we meet Romanians alone, in groups and in whole units, all unarmed. We capitulate, and where is the prod punt? are the only necessary Russian words they know. They look miserable. We point them in the direction of the prod punct and continue on our way. In the sky above us are flying German junkers, but now we are not afraid of them. Now they do not care about us. They are bringing food and ammunition to the encircled group. On the approach to the city, they are met by our fighters and then anti-aircraft guns. Only sometimes one or two airplanes manage to get through to the surrounded. It's not a war, it's a vacation home. Say the soldiers? That's true. But the cold is getting worse and it worries us. At some small station the Germans are hurriedly loading tanks onto platforms. They have no gasoline, so they drag them onto the platforms with camels. From us they are protected by Romanian units which remained loyal to the Germans. Their corn planes raided the station. They dropped bombs. The camels tore their harnesses and fled into the steppe. Romanians saw that strange animals were running at them from the rear threw down their weapons and ran to us in terror to surrender. A few Romanians came running to our trenches. Their overcoats were thin, their eyes were horrified. It's sickening to look at them. What are you afraid of? The officer fearfully points his finger at the steppe and explains. A big dog. The soldiers are dying of laughter. Two camels came running to our trenches. The female is badly wounded. Our doctors are trying to help her. The male is standing there watching. The men have somehow closed the extensive wound, and the male lies down and warms his friend. She's moaning like a human. We mustn't delay. Let's go. Forward to Rostov. We must block the Germans' escape. We don't know neither day nor night. We'll rest a bit and go forward again. On the wagon that accompanies us are some of our fellow Azerbaijanis. Southerners, they have frostbite on their feet and cannot go any further. I run up to them and take off the first one's boots. Why? It's cold. I rub my frostbitten feet with snow. That's the way it is. Ashta, be patient. The other Russian guys follow my example. And now, guys, don't just sit there. Run, move. On the cart lies a Kazakh wounded in yesterday's firefight. He too has frostbite on his feet, but he can't move. I took off my boots and gave them to him, and put on his boots myself. I have good shoelaces. But the next night I also got frostbite on my feet, and the guys rubbed them off with snow. They still hurt at night. We occupy the village of Lisiki. It is not quite calm here. The Cossacks are dissatisfied with the repression against them. The Tsarist General Krasnov has appeared in the Cuban and is raising the Cossacks to revolt. We were shown a woman who axed her husband who had defected to Krasnov. The woman was walking through the village with her son. Suddenly we received an order to move urgently to the Stanitsa Razdri. The Cossacks had cut there at night. First guards, corps, and cut the front. I was temporarily commanding an infantry company. In the field on an empty road we see a car broken by a shell and near it a killed Red Army man. Pavel Kermas takes out documents from the pockets of the dead man and writes down his surname. We stood over him in silence, taking off our ear flaps and moved on. We can't linger. We must hurry. On the way we came across a big farm, we went into warm rooms, warmed up and went on our way again. Hospitable hosts gave each of us a warm, freshly baked bun. But don't eat it right away. Let it cool down. We knew that in the army they give freshly baked bread only the next day. Fresh bread is bad for you. When we had walked three kilometers, Kermis, in order to cool the bun faster, broke it in half. And suddenly he shouted, No, guys don't eat the buns. There's crushed glass in there. They started to check their buns. That's right. It's ground glass. I didn't want to believe it was on purpose. The flower must have gotten glass in it. War. But as I approached Razdor, I had no doubt that it was no accident. Our troops were standing in front of Razdri, and the Krasnovsi did not let us into the village. They put women and children in front of them, and slow, we will not let them in. We sent parliamentarians, 
They explained that the army would sweep them away, that it was deadly dangerous to play these games in the war. But they wouldn't let them. We'll die with our women and children, but we won't let the godless into the village? Udvenko shouts into the phone. I can't. I realize that I'm delaying the operation. I can't shoot women and children. Shoot, but I can't. The army headquarters sent two Katyushas. They positioned themselves behind our lines and hit the Ra's doors, and nothing was left of them. We entered an empty village. Not a single surviving house. I with my company hustled into one house, into another, and no room. Finally, the commander of the company of machine gunners took pity. Make yourselves comfortable, but only on condition. My guys are busy on duty, and you will guard the room and keep the fire going. I agreed. I set the duty and fell asleep. I woke up in total darkness. Someone was swearing. Shoot you not enough. You fell asleep on duty. And in the next room, a boy threw a grenade. I realized that the boy was going to be tried. But the guy is good, efficient, and not a coward. Besides, we were all exhausted. So was he. We've got to save him somehow. I hit the guy a few times. That's for sleeping on duty. Then I went to my superiors and asked them, Yes, punish me for assault. I just beat up a soldier for sleeping on duty. We'll punish you. They promised me. In our army, hand-to-hand -hand behavior was severely punished. But there was no time for that now. We had to keep moving towards Rostov. In the morning, a snowstorm broke out. We walked for a long time, navigating by compass. By evening, the snowstorm intensified. We continued moving and suddenly through the snowstorm we saw German tanks very close to us. I gave the command to disperse. They could suppress us or shoot from a machine gun. We had no anti-tank means. But to my surprise, the Germans hid in the tanks and began to leave quickly. It was not clear who was more frightened, we them or they us. It turns out that such things happen in war. Finally, we got to the farm Krasnodonsky and joined our own. The division was here. I was ordered to take up communications again. The liaison officers received me with joy. In the basement of the hut was a communication centre, and above it was a comfortable room, heated to the heat. A petty officer was resting on the only bunk. He offered me his bunk. Give me something to eat first, I asked, taking off my shoes. But at that moment a shell exploded, so close that the sturdy house shuddered, and screams were heard in the yard. I put my foot back in my boot and ran out into the yard. Two dead men were lying on the snow, and Vasily Ivanovich Nevstruev was still alive. His mouth was grinning and opening and closing, as if he were trying to say something. We ran for the doctor. Vasily Ivanovich did not wait for him. Shuddering with his whole body, he froze and then quietly died. I stood over his body for a long time, but I was without an overcoat and froze. When I returned to the hut, I saw two holes in the wall near the ceiling, and the petty officer was still lying on his bunk and even snoring a little. That surprised me. I came closer to him, and only now I noticed blood on the pillow. The shrapnel had hit the petty officer's head and crushed it. I could have been in his place, I thought, and called for the doctor. He quickly went up to the cabin, looked and said, Hopeless. Thus began our heavy losses. The Germans, having gathered forces, rendered ever-increasing resistance Krasnodinsky was subjected to continuous shelling. During the night we dug shallow holes in the ground, and in the morning it was a windy, frosty morning, standing over the graves of the dead. I made a speech, feeling the futility of even the most sincere words of grief. By this time there were already eight graves. In the afternoon again artillery raid. All who were at the communications centre took refuge in a narrow slit dug by the Germans. The shells were coming closer and closer to the gap. I thought that it was dangerous to stay further in the gap, everybody out of the gap. I shouted and wanted to jump out myself, but I was held back. It's dangerous. They'll kill you. I forcefully pushed those holding me and, jumping out of the gap, ran as far as I could before the explosion and fell. The shell burst and there was a pause. When I got to my feet, I looked at the gap and my legs gave out. There was a mess of bones, ammunition, blood and corpses. I could not recover from the horror for a long time. Then I thought of my brothers and that I had lost them forever and I did not feel well at all. But then it turned out that they and a few others had jumped out after me and were still alive. An interrogator from the military prosecutor's office came in. I knew him well. But today he was officious and strict. He took me off the first interrogation on the occasion of the assault. We will judge. Mm. 
he said and left with his folder. But the trial did not take place. Two days later in the battle near the farm Krasnodonsky, I was seriously wounded. A large shell fragment hit me in the area of the right shoulder blade and penetrated into the lung. I will deliberately not tell you about the pain and suffering I experienced when wounded. I think it is boring. And it is shameful. Pity me, I suffered so much. I'll tell you how I fought for life. When I woke up, it was a moonlit night. And silence, I realized I was wounded, but how? I moved gingerly. I can. So it's not so bad. I ran my left hand over my face. Blood. So in the head, I try to get up on my feet. It's hard, but I can. I am standing and something hot is pouring down my back into my boot. It's blood. So I'm still wounded in the back. I'm standing, I'm not falling. There are many dead on the snow, ours and Germans. We must get to our own, to Kresnodonsk. Its dark houses are visible to me in the frosty fog. I took a step, another, a third. I can, a few more steps. I felt dizzy. My weak legs gave out, and I fell on the snow. I woke up in a farm, in a medical unit. So they found me and brought me here. Of course, it's Pavlusha Kermas. I can see his face. Here I will be helped. The girls take off my clothes. There are lice crawling on my sweater. I'm ashamed. While we were retreating, we didn't have lice. When we started advancing, we got lice from the Germans. Don't be shy, comrade lieutenant. We have even more lice, says the nurse. We opened the wound. The right shoulder blade is wounded. The wound is extensive. A big splinter flew in flat. Be patient, says Pavelusha. There's a bone sticking out here. Now I'll remove it. Why are you... Where are the doctors? Hey, they've all gone ahead. There are only two orderlies here to take the wounded to the hospital. You're lucky. I pulled and pulled a piece of your shoulder blade. Now can you stand it? I'm tolerating it. The wound was dressed. They dressed me again. They didn't touch my right arm. Touching it caused pain. They just put on an overcoat. Pavlusha took me outside and laid me carefully on the cart. I groaned. You need to sit up. Hmm, Pavlusha said. He helped me to sit down. On my left hand, I had a pocket watch converted into a hand watch, my father's only gift to me. No, take it off. You? I asked him. It's for you as a souvenir. A soldier came running, thanking me for saving him. What rescue? I didn't understand at once. Oh, yes, it was you I beat up. I'm sorry I didn't want you to be tried. We said goodbye, and the carriage took me to the front hospital. It was in a village school in a village village. The orderlies helped me into the waiting room. There they drew up my papers. I was taken to a ward. The ward was an empty school classroom, where the wounded were lying on the floor on straw. The stench of pus hit my head. My eyes went black and I fell down. I couldn't stand the smell of pus after lying in a shell crater all day next to the decomposed corpse of a German. It was still summer. After the night battle, I was returning to the division headquarters. It was already noon. It was terribly hot. Suddenly I was shot at. I managed to jump into the nearest funnel and almost suffocated from the stench. In the funnel lay a German corpse decomposed by heat and time. I tried to jump out of the trench, but as soon as I raised my head, a shot rang out and the bullet hit the ground to the right of my ear. I did everything I could not to breathe through my nose and shielded my face from the corpse with my palms. Even once I decided to jump out, let him shoot me, if only not to endure this horror. But as soon as I moved, there was a shot. I imagined myself killed and decomposing as horribly as that German. No, that's not the way I agree. Frontline hysteria. You can't let yourself go. I'll bear it and I endured till night, and at night I got out of the funnel and came to my men. But then for several days I was haunted by that terrible odour, and at the sight of food I vomited. And now smelling it I lost consciousness. I woke up in some hut, on a bed behind a curtain. Through half a delirium I heard a man looking after my mistress. Why did you take this one into the house? he asked. I felt sorry for him. Good boy, I am I, T. I realised that he was talking about me. I forgot myself again. In the morning, I was in the operating room. I felt how the doctors opened the wound, how they probed the splinter with a stylus, how they talked among themselves. Let's not risk it. It's a big fragment. Everything was caught in the wound. My overcoat, hair, vest, and the uniform. A serious operation is required. Let's send him to Cotley Ban, we said another voice. 
There the train will take him to a normal hospital, and we can ruin him. In Kotlubin near the station there was a movie theatre or a club. The furniture had been taken out. Wounded soldiers lay on the floor, on straw, and on the stage officers. They were waiting for an ambulance. A wounded man crawled up to me. I recognised him, the political officer of the scout battalion. He could barely speak for the pain. Don't you know? Is Bozok alive? I don't know. And I'm wounded in the stomach. It's the end. I wanted to say something, but I didn't have the strength. Then I found myself in a small ward where, besides me, there were six other wounded. Five of them did not regain consciousness, and the sixth, a fat, not young man, when I came to my senses, told me that we were lying in the Doko Dilovka. There were such wards, so as not to traumatize the other wounded. I was found unconscious near the door of the club. I don't remember how I felt about it. Probably nothing. I just thought of Irina. You waited, girl, and I forgot myself again. My neighbor was dying of heart failure. He had been punctured and given fluids, but it didn't help. His memory and consciousness seemed to be intact. He knew he was going to die, and he wanted to talk. As soon as I regained consciousness, he began his monologues. The main topic of his monologues was collective farms. Many people preferred to keep silent about it. They were afraid, but he wasn't afraid of anything. He said what he thought nothing will come of this dastardly scheme. Stalin is a demon. Believe me, he is the Antichrist. Only people don't know that. He's got toes on his foot. Whose? The father of my interlocutor was a prosperous peasant. He was cuckolized and exiled with his family to Siberia. People there died like flies. My mother was the first to die of hunger and resentment. The father, dying, said to his son, Run, they'll catch you. Mm. And if they catch you, run again. After his father's death, he, a boy, ran away. Many people helped him to hide, though they realized that he was a fugitive. The elderly Lizaveta Kozhushnaya was especially kind to him. She betrayed him. He was sent to Siberia again, and he stayed a little while, pretended to repent of everything. And then he ran away again. Now he didn't trust anyone. He hid his name and surname. He worked in auxiliary jobs, earning his bread, and one day, after many years, he decided to sneak into his village. He wanted to see the love of his youth. He came to his village at night, secretly sneaked into his neighbor's shed. There he saw a locker that stood in their house. Its door was torn off. He lovingly stroked the locker, all that remained of his past life. Then, when the village was asleep, he crept to the house where she lived. He peered through the dark windows, but saw nothing. Then he, who was no longer an old man, climbed a tree and looked through the window. The house was dark. If she is still at home, it means she is not married, he reasoned. Suddenly one window lit up and he saw her in her nightgown, and the heavy, not young man telling me this sobbed. It wasn't so much what he was telling me, but the way he sobbed, remembering his blighted past, that told me more than he could tell me in words. In those rare clears of my mind, I learned a lot from him. I remembered my friend Pavlusha, once in the midst of it, when there seemed to be no chance of life at all, he had said. I agree with everything Stalin did, except collective farms. At that time we did not know much, and it seemed wild to me. Now I doubted that I was right. During the time that I was lying in Docha Dalovka, my neighbors in the ward died without regaining consciousness. The last to die was my cardiac neighbor. New candidates for the other world came to our ward. There was a medical committee about it. The doctors debated who had a chance of life and decided that no one had a chance. Hmm, doctor, come to me, I asked. The Armenian doctor was surprised. Do you hear? He is still talking. He came to my bunk. Well, dear, is it hard? Doctor, I'm not going to die. Move me to a normal room. The doctor was even more surprised. We were taken to another hospital in a stewed baker. When we entered a village on a completely empty road, another car hit us. Our car rolled over on its side. When the shock of the impact passed, I crawled out of the open door and crawled to the nearest hut. I knocked on the door and called for help. The wounded were left in the car, but the owner did not open the door. I took out my gun and wanted to shoot, but I didn't have the strength to pull the trigger. Then I cried out of resentment. Soldiers passed by. They saw the blood on me. Why are you lying here in the snow? I told them what had happened to us, and at once everything started to move. Someone ran for the sled, someone for the doctor. They opened the door for me. The landlady gave me a long sigh. 
Hey, I didn't know it was such a disaster. More than half of them died in the car and the driver died too. I'm sorry, old woman, I didn't know. I thought he was drunk. And you, dear, you can't lie like that. I'll put you on a bench in the morning. Cars are passing by. Maybe they'll pick you up. And so they did. Artilleryman passed by, picked me up and took me to Krasnoamesk. So I ended up in a hospital in Krasnoamesk near Stalingrad. I don't know what happened to me, but I felt better. I didn't lose consciousness anymore. I had an appetite. The hospital was a hall in which instead of bunks there were bed-sized quadrangles made of boards. They were stuffed with straw. Coffins, that's what the wounded affectionately called them. They were well fed here. The main foodstuffs were vodka and chocolate, sometimes porridge. All of us were waiting for a transport that would take us beyond the Volga to a real hospital. But a day passed, another day, and the transport didn't come. You have such a wound that every day without surgery is very dangerous. There are still foreign objects in the wound, he said the elderly doctor. I know, I replied. But what do I do? You need to get to Leninsk immediately. There you will have an operation. Can you stay on your feet? I can, but not for long. Go outside and ask for a hitchhiker. That's your salvation. There's another wounded man coming out with you. He too needs urgent help. He's getting gangrene. We were dressed as best we could and let out into the street. My partner was on crutches, I was in bandages and overcoat. Only my left arm was in the sleeve. A fresh frost engulfed us. We looked around. On the road cars were rushing past us, but all for some reason from Stalingrad. Thirty paces away from us, a line of women with buckets and cans stood at the column. Water was pouring out of the column in a thin trickle. My partner Shurik said, Let's ask them, and headed towards the queue. He was on crutches, but he moved faster than me. By the time I got to the middle of the line, he was already coming back to me and pointing to some yard. There's a truck in this yard. A doctor has come here. He works in a hospital in Leninsk. We went into the yard. There was indeed a truck there. We asked the driver who the owner was. A military doctor. A surgeon. He came to visit his sick mother. We need to go to the hospital in Leninsk. Can you give us a ride? Ask the doctor. Soon the doctor himself came out. Who are you? He asked us in a not very friendly manner. Deserters? We showed our certificates. The doctor's tone changed. What are you talking about? Of course I'll take it. Get in the back. And seeing my difficulties helped me to climb over the side. He drove through Stalingrad. The city was a ruin. Only the roads were cleared of broken bricks. Huge fires were burning among the ruins. They were burning the corpses of Germans. They were stacked, doused with fuel and set on fire to avoid epidemics. It was necessary to get rid of the dead before the thaw. It was not a pleasant sight. The fire thawed the corpses and made them seem to move. I was already sick and this made me dizzy and nauseous. Sodoms of black smoke rose to the sky from the fire, smelling of burnt meat. Purgatory flashed through my mind. I do not remember how we crossed the Volga. I must have fallen asleep. In Leninsk we were sprayed with blast. They put me on the bunks. I was waiting for them to come for me any minute. But evening came and then night, but no one came for me, and time went on. And there was no telling what was going on in my wound. Finally I decided to go to the operating room myself and make a little scandal. Why am I not getting help? I have a lung wound. I got off the bunk and made my way to the operating room. Opening the door, I found myself in a large room. Across the room to the operating room in a line stood tall stretcher carriages. Burnt tankers were lying on them. It's without hair and eyebrows, instead of faces, solid wounds and only eyes still preserved and looked, full of inhuman agony. And the arms bent at the elbow, they held in the balance, on the gauze that covered the wire frame. Black bones instead of fingers, and the fact that they trembled slightly made it even scarier. I realized why I hadn't been called to the oar, and I was ashamed of my selfish impulse. I also realized that I was doing badly, that my turn would not come soon enough. My wound reminded me of itself with pain and odor. I was afraid it would fester. In the morning, we were told that an ambulance would leave the station at noon. Those who could walk to the station could go to a normal rear hospital. It wasn't far to the station by military standards. I thought it was crazy to stay here. I've walked hundreds of kilometers. Maybe together with other wounded I'll get there. We were fed. 
The orderlies helped us to dress and we went. There were fifteen people in the group. At first I walked along with all of them and was surprised that I could. Then I started to lag behind a little. Then the group got farther away from me. I realised that I had overestimated my abilities. It was to go back. Most of the distance had been covered. We must go forward. And the group went farther and farther away. And finally I was alone on the road. Struggling with deathly fatigue, pain and nausea, it came to my throat. I took one step at a dream was getting stronger. My blood didn't warm. The frost was piercing me through. Somewhere to the right of the road I could see a village. I'll get to the village, I thought. This is my salvation. But to reach the village was not enough strength. My eyes went black and I fell down. This is the end, I thought. Well, I fought as long as I could. In the morning I will be found frozen. It's even good it will end my torment. Through my slumber I could hear voices and a girl's laughter. A dream. A hallucination, I thought, and opened my eyes. Two girls of about fifteen stood over. You're wounded. Why are you lying down? I sang us on my way to the station, to the ambulance. I mumbled, barely moving my frozen lips. I didn't make it. I closed my eyes again. And again I heard the girl's laughter. It drifted away and quickly died away. A mirage, I thought again, falling asleep. Wake up. Wake up. I heard through my sleep. I didn't want to open my eyes. Wake up. The girl's voice insisted. I opened my eyes and saw first a sled, and then a blanket in the hands of one of the teenagers. The two of them lifted me up and put me on the sledge, covered me with a blanket, and ran like two young horses to the station. They came and almost on the run squeezed me into the open door of the calf carriage. The train was gaining speed. There was a hot stove burning in the car. Soon it became warm, and I fell asleep lying on the floor by the stove. I must have slept for a long time until they woke me up to eat. Where did you get that plastic? A man's voice asked me. What plastic? This one. The wounded officer was holding my clipboard. Hmm, from the Stalingrad department store. My girls used to cut cuffs out of it. What girls? Natalists from the army headquarters. Uh, I know. I led them out of the encirclement. Your name is Grigory? Yes. The girls are talking about you all the time. You're a real hero to them? I was pleased to hear about the girls and that they remember me. The wounded were interested in our conversation and began to ask me for details. I answered. Soldiers love to talk and hear about women, especially the wounded. Separated from their families and loved ones, they miss the company of women. Many of them carefully kept photos of brides and wives in their breast pockets. The elderly kept photos of their wives and children. In those distant times, we often talked about love. We had never heard the words to make love, and what songs we sang during that bloody war. All of them were full of pure sadness for our loved ones. Of course, there were vulgar people among us, but vulgarity and cynicism were not in fashion at that time. Do you want to lie down in my place? offered the commander of the telephonists. It was a gesture of respect. I appreciated it, but I declined. No, thank you. It was warm to lie on my stomach by the stove. It made my wound hurt less. I didn't want to change my position. In the night, a soldier climbed down from the bunk and in the darkness stepped on my back. I howled in pain. The soldiers got excited. At the nearest station, someone ran to a neighboring wagon and brought a nurse. She took a look and refused to even fix my bandage. It's dangerous here. Aloud and here there is straw coal. Soon we will be in Voronezh, where the dead will be removed from the company cars. You with your wounds should get into a company car. In Voronezh the guys helped me down from the Taplushka, and I went to the head of the train. I saw the stretchers with the dead being taken out of the company car. I increased my step as much as I could, but I still walked like a turtle. I didn't have enough strength, and my wound hurt. It was a good thing that the echelon stayed in Voronezh for a long time. When I finally reached the nearest company car, I climbed the steps with all my might and went inside the car. All the shelves were occupied, but one shelf was empty. The sheets and blanket were smeared with blood. I, as I was in my overcoat, fell into it and tried to catch my breath. The transition and climbing the steps were not easy for me. Soon I fell asleep. What kind of vigilantism is this? Why is he here in an overcoat? Who authorized it? The deputy commander of the echelon was raging. 
I opened my eyes. Hey, immediately get out of here. I looked at him in silence and decided to myself that I would never leave. Wait, don't make a fuss, interrupted the ardor of the deputy chief medical officer of the Echelon, and, turning to me calmly, asked, Do you have a certificate of injury? It's in my overcoat pocket. Take it, please. No, but there must be order, insisted the deputy commander. Hey, the lieutenant has shrapnel in his lungs, raised his voice. Immediately undress the wounded, replace bedding and underwear, and then, to dressing? The chief left and the nurses took care of me. Then I had a dressing. Most importantly, they gave me a shot and the pain went away. I felt as good as I'd ever felt. I even forgot about the wound for a while. And the echelon was travelling across Russia, past destroyed cities and ruined villages. Gradually, the landscape began to change. Whole towns and villages began to appear. The train was taking us to the east. The wounded said that we were approaching Chelyabinsk and lists were being drawn up of who should be left in Chelyabinsk hospitals. To Chelyabinsk. And my mother is not far from Chelyabinsk in the city of Kurgan, I thought worriedly. I need to be taken off the train in Chelyabinsk. The nurse helped me to dress and led me through the platforms between the cars to the superiors. Nutchmi turned out to be on the operation. I had to turn to the deputy police officer. We take the wounded not to relatives, but to hospitals. The deputy commander answered me, having heard my request, and irritably added, Go to your place. But I did not leave. The deputy commander was busy with an important problem. It was necessary to hold a polit information, and he did not have a working receiver. He didn't know the latest news. Would you like me to fix your receiver? Can you do that? I can, if you take me off the train in Chelyabinsk. You're stubborn. You're stubborn too. Put me on the list for Chelyabinsk and the receiver will work. What can I do with you? The deputy commander waved his hands and put my name on the cherished list. I started to work on the receiver. My right hand worked, but some nerve in my left was partially damaged, and when I touched something with my fingers, the pain was indescribable. The medics said it was hyperesthesia. Despite the hellish pain, I fixed the receiver. I was taken off the train with a group of wounded, put on a bus and brought to the hospital. They placed us temporarily in the lobby and demanded that we take off our hairstyles. The officers disagreed. All right, said the superiors. You will lie here until you cut your hair. We have no right to transfer you to normal wards, so the wounded decided to insist. But I could not afford to postpone the operation and gave permission to cut my hair. I was called a Shrike Britcher. Fortunately, this nickname did not stick. After a day they gave up. I was operated on without delay. A few days I was kept in the intensive care ward. I do not remember this time well. There was a high temperature, but in time I withdrew and I was transferred to the general ward. I felt not only resurrected, but I was in paradise. Enemy planes did not reach Chelyabinsk at that time. In the city there was no blackout, no paper crosses on the windows, in the evenings electric lamps shone in full. The doctors and nurses were attentive and kind. They gave me paper and I wrote a letter to my mother. I waited for her arrival. Soon breathing became easier and I enjoyed the fresh air. There were a few convalescents in the ward who had been released to the city. They came back full of impressions and told me about their adventures. Then I noticed that some of the stories about their intimacy with women were sympathetic to me, while the stories of others somehow made me dislike them. At the time, I didn't think about why this was happening. Now, because in the former I heard respect and sometimes admiration for women, and in the latter, cynicism and boasting of their victories. In our ward, there was a plush little man about 40 years old. He wasn't wounded. He had some kind of bone disease that prevented him from moving. One day he invited me to sit by his bed, took out a stack of photos and started to show me. The pictures were of beautiful women, tastefully dressed for the time and not at all vulgar. He gave each picture a hurtful comment and bragged that he had lived with each of these women. I was disgusted to hear him brag. I didn't finish the packet, jumped to my feet and shout, You're lying, you bastard. None of those women were close to you. You're slandering them. Look at yourself in the mirror. You're not a man. You're a plump midget and a boy. My sudden anger frightened him. He dropped the pictures, which scattered on the parquet, and he covered himself under the blanket with his head. From then on, I treated him with extreme hostility. Several times he tried to justify himself. 
There are some people you can't be frank with. They don't know what women are like, and women are insidious and jealous. Our sister Reichka is modest, but she looks at men with greedy eyes. She also wants... Shut up, asshole. If you keep yapping, I'll kill you. I threatened. He covered his head with the blanket again, and I went to his bed, lifted one leg of his bed with my left hand and dropped it. It clattered to the floor. The little man jumped out of bed, ran out into the hallway, and into the doctor. Now, it turns out I was right. You're a faker. Not only can you move, but you can run. He was discharged from the hospital the same day. It was spring. The windows in the ward were open, and we heard how he, leaving, turned to our windows and shout. You're all fascists. Seeing this period was fruitful for me. I was getting better, and as if filled with fresh spiritual strength. When I became able to read, the nice girl librarian began to bring me books. Then I read Tolstoy's War and Peace for the first time, savouring the episodes and finding in them much in common with the war I knew. I remember when I read the novel to the end, I felt orphaned, having lost my dear heroes, whom I loved, whom I used to think about. They remained with me in my soul, in my memory, but I lacked daily communication with them. Under the influence of this book, I began to think about the war in which I participated, and a nice librarian brought me Lavrenev's novels. I was impressed by the story 41st. It seemed to me consonant with my thoughts about the Civil War. I realized that the war was fought among themselves, not perverts and saints, but convinced people, and everyone defended their ideals. It was the tragedy of a nation being torn to pieces. I didn't think about the movie at the time. But from this book I got anew my own idea about the Civil War, as well as about the Patriotic War. During the Civil War, the Western countries intervened against the young Soviet country. The British landed in the north in Murmansk, the French in Odessa, the Japanese in the Far East. Each hoped to grab for themselves a tidbit of agonizing Russia, but the intervention failed. We had to get out of Russia. Why? Radio station Liberty, which has taken upon itself the mission of teaching us Russian history, explains it by the lack of a unified plan. Our new historians echo them. They are afraid of falling behind progress. In fact, the intervention failed for another reason. The West was afraid of the Bolshevik contagion to which its soldiers and sailors were exposed. It was urgent to leave in order not to bring the bacillus of revolution into their countries. The West was sure that Bolshevik Russia would soon fall under the burden of its own strife, hunger, typhus, and lack of a normal economy. But Russia did not fall. After surviving blood, famine, and devastation, it recovered, grew stronger, and gained muscle. Western politicians were unable to understand the processes taking place in Russia. Living in an atmosphere of domination of private property, they could not believe that it was possible to starve and, toiling from the last strength, to build some incomprehensible and hostile to them state. The successes of Soviet Russia caused them mystical fear. Russia interfered with their existence. If there was a country that would agree to war with Russia, but there was no such country. In 1933, Adolf Hitler came to power in Germany. Germany, which had lost the First World War, was in ruins. A huge contribution imposed on each German by the victorious countries, unemployment, hunger, insulted national ego. Adolf Hitler promised Germans revenge against the British and French for the unjust Versailles peace treaty. Germany lost the war, he said, but it was not the Germans' fault but the Jews' ease. They cried out for humanism. But what humanism can there be in war? Either you kill or you are killed? The Germans liked the Fuhrer's simple logic. It flattered their national ego. It's nice to blame someone else for their own misfortunes. Hitler attributed all Germany's troubles to the lack of living space other countries have colonies, but Germany does not. The task of the Germans, he said, was to establish a new order in Europe. Not the British and not the French should prevail in it, and the Germans are the superior race, superhumans, the best organizers in the world. To the east of Germany's borders lie rich, fertile lands. They are inhabited by the Slavs, the inferior race. These lands will belong to Germany and the Slavs will be turned into obedient slaves. For the bourgeois West, Hitler was a gift of destiny. That's who they would pit against the Soviet Union. And they began to feed Germany to finance its armed forces. While working on the movie Remembrance, I went through Goebbels's archive. I saw the first marches of Hitler's young men. They wore cheap uniforms and looked very pathetic. But soon everything changed, new good uniforms appeared, military factories started working, 
modern weapons appeared. The West was giving Germany generous investments, preparing it for war. The Soviet Union was increasingly worrying the politicians of the West. Now they realized that our country was not to be trifled with. If only there was a country ready to go to war with the hated USR, you should not get into a fight with a strong enemy. You should push your enemies and do everything to make the war between them last as long as possible. Let the opponents kill each other, let them exhaust themselves, and then England, having preserved its forces, will dictate the terms of peace. There is no doubt. The strategy is clever and in the history of England played a significant role. Except that from the point of view of humanism and justice, it may not seem quite... The Allies had every reason to hate and fear the Soviet Union, already at its birth declared itself as the gravedigger of capitalism. Naturally, the West did not like its gravedigger. It was hoped that by pitting it against its other enemy, German fascism, it would be possible to bring about the collapse of the Soviet Union. It didn't. The Soviet Union emerged from the war even stronger and more dangerous to the West than it had been before the war. The Baltics and Moldavia, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Romania, Hungary, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, China with a billion people, Korea, Vietnam, Cuba became socialist. The boom of studying Russian language all over the world began the fashion for everything Russian in clothing. In 1957, I was with my movie at the festival in France, in Cannes. I was struck by the fact that many Western participants of the festival were wearing Russian Kosovorotki and rope belts with tussles. At our reception, the guests pounced on caviar and Russian vodka with such fervor that they knocked over the buffet. Some looked at us with approving curiosity, others with apprehension, but indifferent looks were not. Our actors were the center of attention. Never has the prestige of our country was not so high as in these years. France and Italy had the world's largest influential communist parties. The West had to defend itself against the triumphant march of socialism. Its spread had to be stopped. For the capitalist West, it was a matter of life and death. At the end of the war, the Americans used the atomic bomb against the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. These cities were of no military, much less strategic importance. They were destroyed to show the world their infernal weapons. The US was the monopolist of the atomic bomb. The era of atomic blackmail had begun, but a year and a half later, we had the atomic bomb. For a country that had just endured a war in its own territory, the strain on the economy was enormous. After all, the US was fighting in Europe and the Pacific. England suffered mainly from bombing. Our country was fighting on its own territory, struggling with superior enemy forces. Our army was retreating all the way to the Volga, and from the Volga it was advancing to Berlin. Naturally, our losses and destruction were incomparably greater than those of the Allies, and the burden on the weak economy was correspondingly greater. Then the United States began to surround us along the perimeter of borders with military airfields to deliver an atomic bomb to Moscow or the Urals. The aviation of the time would have taken dozens of minutes, and to strike back across the ocean, we would have needed many hours. For a while, the US felt like the masters of the situation. But our scientists responded by creating an intercontinental ballistic missile capable of carrying a nuclear warhead. This caused incredible panic in the US. They were developing a preemptive strike doctrine. It was believed that only a preemptive strike could ensure victory in an atomic war. U.S. Secretary of War for Estelle threw himself out of a skyscraper. Can you imagine what he was preparing for us if he was so afraid of our atomic weapons? I did not bring this up to stir up anti-American or anti-Western sentiment, but only to remind you of the unimaginable burden placed on the Soviet people and their war-weakened economy. All funds were spent on the arms race. No wonder our store shelves were empty. The arms race was difficult for Western countries, but it was impossible for us. The West expected that in this race the fat would lose weight and the thin would die. And then the West declared a Cold War with Churchill's mouth. Many people think of the Cold War as a kind of bickering in a communal kitchen. But the Cold War was far from a squabble. Hundreds of US scientific institutions worked on the strategy and tactics of the Cold War, one of the most difficult and destructive wars in human history. The Cold War is like atomic radiation. It has no smell, taste or color. It goes unnoticed by the enemy, especially for the unprepared for it. It does not rattle guns, buildings do not collapse, soldiers do not fall down bleeding. It acts imperceptibly, but as terribly destroys society, as radiation destroys the human body. Cold War, 
a new insidious destructive weapon, the greatest invention of the XX century. One spearhead of the Cold War was directed at the spiritual values of our people. It was they, spiritual values, that gave us the strength to withstand and win the Great Patriotic War. In the meantime, my mother arrived. Letters at that time, whether because of censorship or for other reasons, went slowly. But as soon as my mother received the letter, she immediately came to Chelyabinsk and appeared at the hospital. Do we need to talk about the joy we experienced when we met? I don't remember what we talked about and how. I only remember the feeling of happiness from talking to her. Of course, she was worried about my injury. I, in turn, tried to calm her down in every possible way. I braved, demonstrated my health. My mother told me that in Chelyabinsk, in the School of Navigators of Long-Range Bomber Aviation, my school friend Karl Bondarev. Somewhere in Pushkin I read the phrase a poem is a deed. I realized that for Pushkin a deed was very important, that he tried to act in such a way that not before others, but first of all before himself not to be ashamed of his actions. I too wanted to do the same. One day my mother did not come to see me alone. She accidentally met my Melitopol schoolmate on the street. He wanted to visit me. How did you end up in Chelyabinsk? I asked him. Hmm. I'm here with my institute. Do institutes work now? I was surprised. Almost all of them are. After the war, the country will need a lot of specialists. We must look ahead, he said an obviously memorized phrase. Do you teach? No. I'm in management and nothing deputy director of supplies. This he said with the greatest importance and, to confirm his importance in life, offered me. Listen, do you want to make you a military instructor of the institute? You've had enough of exposing your forehead to bullets. I was offended by this proposal. I took it as an offer to desert. That would be an act I'd be ashamed of. Mother asked this gentleman to leave our room. He was surprised, but got up and left saying, I'm for his own good, Mom proudly replied. We'll manage without you. He left without realizing anything and obviously thought I was crazy. After he left, we talked with my mom about the fact that it's good. The war and the institutes are working. So we'll win. We'll definitely win, mom said. She took elite wheat to Kurgan from Ukraine and was proud of the fact that despite the terrible famine, no one used even one elite grain. I believed her and was proud of my mom too. Her act was no exception. It was a time of mass heroism at the front and on the home front. Factory girls were on duty at the hospital as orderlies. After an 11-hour work shift, they came here to do something to help the seriously wounded. Often they would sit by the bedside of the seriously wounded all night and then run to the factory to work. It was a natural need of a girl to spend the unclaimed wealth of her soul on another, often unfamiliar, but sympathetic young man. I, already recovering, was assigned to read articles from newspapers to the seriously wounded. There was a bad odour in the wards for the heavy, but now I had the strength to defeat it. In these wards I could often observe. A girl sitting at the bedside of a dying man, holding his hand and cheering for him with all her soul. I believed that in this case he would not die, and I still do. My mother received some letter and hurried to Kurgan. She had urgent business waiting for her there. I'm sorry, son. I can't help you, but they need me very much there. I understood that. They started letting me out into the city. The first thing I did was to go to my friend Carl's school and spend a few hours with him. He had been in love with our fellow student Tanya Kolobashkina, a lovely, beautiful blonde, since high school, and here in Chelyabinsk, all his thoughts were about her. He was burdened by the fact that he, a talented navigator, was left as a teacher at the school while he aspired to the front. I still have a long, unmarred 60-year friendship with Carl. Intelligent, talented, honest, he was a strong influence on me. I owe many of my achievements to him, and the letter I sent to Komsomolskaya Pravda was printed. On the day of the 50th anniversary of the newspaper, it was reprinted again. Finally, I passed the commission and received a certificate of limited fitness for military service. With this certificate, I was sent to the Sverdlovsk region as an officer in a marching company. Arriving at the place, I, of course, familiarized myself with the situation. I did not like it. Being afraid of being sent to the front, officers, as I could observe, brutalized their subordinates and were servile to their superiors. I considered it a disgrace to serve here, and, taking advantage of Stalin's order to return paratroopers after treatment to the paratroopers, 
I managed to get sent to Moscow. No one has seen this order. It is quite possible that it did not exist at all, but I believed in it and made others believe in it. The chiefs of the marching companies felt that I was not their man, that the front did not scare me and did not delay me. I received a direction to the Moscow military district. When I arrived in Moscow, I first of all went to Karl's parents and told them about my meeting with him. Karl's father asked me to introduce him to Tanya. He liked the girl and approved of Karl's choice. The headquarters of the Moscow military district was located in the post office building on Kirovskaya Street. Having familiarized himself with my certificate of limited fitness, the lieutenant colonel said, We'll send you to the searchlight battalion, and asked, Are you satisfied? No, I answered without hesitation. I'm an officer of airborne troops. Send me, according to the order of the Supreme Commander-in-Chief, at the disposal of the headquarters of the airborne troops. Is there such an order? Yes, there is. Have you seen it? I read it. I lied and coming to the phone, asked. Me a permission, Comrade Lieutenant Colonel? No permission, said the Lieutenant Colonel sternly. Where do you intend to call? This are the headquarters of my troops. You are of limited fitness, and you have arrived at our disposal. You will serve in the Searchlight Battalion. I really didn't want to be in the Searchlight Battalion. Serving in the rear during the war seemed to me unworthy. Wandering around the headquarters, I still found a telephone and called Colonel Ivinenko. He knew me from the 33rd Division. Now he was promoted and transferred to the main headquarters. I told him about the situation. It's good that you called. Mm. He praised me. I'm sending a captain for you. From the headquarters of the airborne troops to the headquarters of the Moscow military district, five minutes walk. Soon the captain came and fought to win me back. Having asked about my health and having received the answer healthy and feeling fine, Ivaninko decided, let's send you to the second brigade as a platoon commander. Why platoon commander? I objected. I commanded a radio room at the front in the harshest conditions. I was appreciated, and you send me as a platoon commander. What have I done to you? You're young, Chukrai. You have no military education. The military council won't approve you. Hey, I got my education at the front. It's stronger than officers' school. I argued. For me, it was not only a matter of prestige, but also a desire to have less superiors over me. In the army, it is very important. All right, Nivanenko agreed. Come tomorrow at nine o'clock. We'll continue this conversation. As usual, I stayed at Carl's house, where I took the streetcar. At the streetcar stop at Carl's house, I met Professor Kislovsky, the father of another school friend of mine. He greeted me with a military-style hand on the visor of his cap. By the way, he said, I was in the Moscow militia. In the Moscow militia. I questioned him. I had always respected him, but now I respected him even more. I knew of his noble origins and his ironic attitude toward the Soviet government, and the fact that in a difficult time for the country he went to defend Moscow was both dear and... Wasn't it difficult for you? I asked, bearing in mind his age. No. Imagine, not at all. I am a good shot, and I like military discipline. It is quite natural for a Russian man to defend Moscow. It was difficult for me only. He hesitated, and then confessed. At the Politin Formatsky, and he laughed a hearty, kind laugh. At Karl's house, I was accepted as a relative. I never felt uncomfortable at their house. Karl's father asked me about the front. The next day, at the appointed time, I was at Ivanenko's. You'll go to the 5th Brigade as an inspector. Hmm. I'm not an official. I'm a combat officer. You're going. That's an order. You'll write a report and send it to me. And we'll think about your position. There was nothing to do. I went to the location of the 5th Brigade. The commander of the brigade's communications company, whom I checked, turned out to be a good guy, but an alcoholic. He immediately confessed that he had drunk three parachutes and several pairs of Kirzov boots. Do you realize you'll be severely prosecuted? I do. Hmm. I'll do my best to make it easier for you. You don't have to do anything. I'm a finished man, he objected. Still, I wrote a report in which I asked Ivanenko to treat the company commander with sympathy and not to ruin the guy. The answer came not soon. Ivanenko ordered, Suspend the company commander from his post. Send him to the hospital for compulsory treatment. The communication company to take me.